Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this annual edition of the MHA program at Telfer's um, CEO and residence. It's um, great that you were able to join us today. Uh, this is, in fact, the second event of the day as part of the CEO and resident uh, undertaking. Uh, we had an excellent career planning session uh, with the students and uh, Matt Anderson uh, just uh, finished about half an hour ago and um, learned a lot of things about Matt's career and his lessons learned that I know will uh, uh, certainly serve our students well as they enter their careers. Um, this event has a long history of uh, engaging health leaders and managers and um, in this particular uh, event and uh, this tradition has certainly been kept up this year with uh, with Matt Anderson agreeing to be our CEO in residence. Uh, obviously the medium this year has changed as we increasingly uh, learn to live in a virtual world but we're so grateful that we can continue this important event uh, despite that. So before calling on uh, Jonathan Patrick to introduce uh, Matt, I'd like to uh, read our Indigenous affirmation. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region, from all nations across Canada, who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Thank you. The, just a couple of instructions uh, as we move forward. Um, please note this uh, webinar will be conducted in English only. It will be recorded and emailed to all participants in the next few days. Secondly, please use the Q&A feature to add comments, react to other messages, and submit your questions for the Q&A at the end of Matt's presentation. So without further ado, I'll call on Jonathan Patrick to introduce Matt Anderson. Jonathan. Thank you, George. Uh, and thank you all for coming um, in this unusual version of our CEO in residence. Um, as many, of, as many of you know, uh, the Telfer's commitment to health management dates back over 50 years to the foundation of the MHA program. What you may be less well aware of is the recent uh, commitment uh, that has been made by the school. And the 12 years that I've been here, we have added an MSc in health systems, a health stream in our PhD, and a health analytics option to our undergraduate program. In lockstep with that, we have uh, been hiring a number of professors who have an interest in various aspects of health management, from operations to policy to health governance to information technology. I would encourage you to explore our website, to explore the programs that we have on offer, and to encourage uh, promising candidates in your own organizations to consider our programs in the future. I would also encourage you to take a look at the profiles of our professors. There may very well be a question that's been bugging you, uh, that you might not have had time to explore and that might work well as a research partnership with one of our professors. In addition, uh, next year we will be continuing the MHA speaker series as well as our health research seminar series and I encourage you uh, if you are interested to let us know and we can notify you about those events. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Matt Anderson. Uh, he is an experienced healthcare leader, team builder and advocate for positive change. He is widely respected among Ontario's healthcare system for his intense focus on the needs and experiences of patients and caregivers. Before joining Ontario Health, Matthew was president and CEO of Lake Ridge Health, one of the largest community hospital systems in the province. Um, and what I found out this morning, um, much to my excitement, is that Matt has a, a major in English. Um, and then he took all his electives in, in math and computer science. Uh, that excited me because I'm a math guy who took all I could in the English department. So um, I was quite excited to hear that. Anyway, please uh, welcome Matt Anderson. Great, thank you, Jonathan. We're a kindred spirit, you and I, I'm sure. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for the opportunity to come and spend some time with you today. Um, I, I very much uh, miss 
the opportunity to come to Ottawa. Um, I love Ottawa. I love the town. Um, and as a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, I love the Ottawa Senators. Uh, on the occasions that we've met in the playoffs, you've been most accommodating. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm sure uh, we'll get another opportunity when, uh, when this uh, pandemic moves past. Maybe uh, George will invite me out one more time. I'll, I'll sit on the other side, though. I'll listen to someone else and, and ask the tough questions. Um, so thank you. I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, today. I know uh, you've, you've welcomed me and, and allowed me to, to speak for about a half an hour or so. Um, I, I will try to stick to around those timelines. I, I, I will tell you now I enjoy the question and answer portion uh, the most. Um, I love to hear about what's on people's minds. Um, had a great session, as you heard, about a half an hour ago, particularly for the students out there. You know, I really want to promote uh, the students to ask questions. Um, questions from the students uh, are, in fact, sort of the payback for me in all of this. I love to know uh, what's on the minds of our young folks. Uh, tomorrow's leaders, what are they thinking about? What are the questions? And don't be afraid to ask me the tough ones, and particularly the ones that uh, seem most obvious. Um, you know, like why do we put our financial model the way that it does when it incents completely the wrong behavior? Things like that. Feel free to ask those questions, um, and I'm happy to to do my best to answer them and, and to take you through. Uh, so I will take you through a little bit. I'm going to just walk you through Ontario Health, um, and before I before I take you through Ontario Health, I'm going to back up just a tiny little bit. Um, some of you may have been on the on the um, discussion this morning, so I I won't spend too much time. Uh, talking about my background, and, and there was the uh, the brief that, that Johnson just gave. The only thing that I really want to highlight is that I've been at Ontario Health for four months. Um, and if you do the math, uh, uh, COVID has been in our environment for three and a half months. Um, so that gives you a sense as to uh, what my experience has been at Ontario Health. So some of what I'm going to be talking to you about is in fact uh, what Ontario Health uh, is or is what I've come into. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that I face um, as we go forward, um, particularly because I've spent a lot of time on COVID and not spending as much time um, about Ontario Health. And I'm going to unpack all that for you uh, as we go through our talk. So um, maybe why don't we get started? Um, and uh, Genevieve, if you could give me a, a next click there. Um, so a little bit about Ontario Health, uh, and I won't walk you through all the different bullet points. This is uh, some of the, the core messaging and the concepts behind Ontario Health. Um, and it's really trying to build upon um, some of the work that's been done by the agencies that have rolled into uh, Ontario Health. And as you can see, we've brought together 21 agencies. I'm going to, to, to unpack that a little bit more for you in just a moment. Um, and the kinds of things that we're trying to do are down the, the right-hand side of your page. Um, and I would say that uh, a couple of the things that are there that um, are of, of particular attraction, you know, one of the big challenges that we'll face as Ontario Health, one of the big challenges we face in the healthcare system is this concept of patient experience. Um, and what does that mean? Uh, and, and how do we build that in in a true and meaningful way? Um, and those words, patient experience, have been around for a long, long time. And I would say we've got a long way to go uh, in truly building the patient experience uh, into our healthcare system. Um, but and, and happy, I'm going to throw a few teasers out there as we're talking. I, I believe you're going to start asking, putting questions in the chat room uh, right away. So as I go, uh, when I make some of these comments, if they're at all interest to you, please uh, put them on the, on the chat room because I think there's lots to talk about around patient experience and what does that really mean. Uh, digital first. Uh, so for those of you who were uh, on the call this morning or, or earlier this afternoon, you'll know that I, I started in IT. Um, my uh, my passion is is for uh, IT uh, and for digital or e-health, whatever is the words that we're using these days. Um, but really the idea of virtual care. Um, and in Ontario Health, we're trying to bring together very disparate elements of the virtual care system in Ontario and trying to get that into, into one place. Um, and then uh, the concept of clear accountability. Uh, one of the big challenges that we have uh, is uh, that we do have so many different parts of the system funded in different ways. Um, very difficult to, to sort of get that into one particular place. The Ontario Health Teams, which I'll comment on in a few minutes, is a little bit of a part of that. So lots of different elements. The, the clinical guidance up at the top. Um, uh, oh, Genevieve is moving me along, so I'm going to move along to the next slide. Uh, and uh, I just say that the, the clinical guidance concept actually fits in very nicely uh, to Genevieve is reading my mind. She already knew where I was going. No, it's okay. You can get me to that next slide, Genevieve. We're perfect. 
uh, Health Quality Ontario and Cancer Care. So these are the, the agencies that are part of uh, Ontario Health now, uh, 21 agencies. Um, and where I was going with the clinical guidance and where Genevieve knew I was going with the clinical guidance is that Health Quality Ontario and Cancer Care Ontario, that is really sort of their raison d'etre, right? Um, of putting out uh, and trying to establish a core way of, of being and a core way of doing things. And I would say Cancer Care Ontario in particular has been very successful in this over the years, over the decades. Um, uh, the cancer system in Ontario uh, is, is as fine as any in the world. And I would say largely to do with uh, the work of Cancer Care Ontario and this concept of standardization of guidance, getting that out across the healthcare system, sprinkle a little bit of money in there for incentives and moving that forward. Um, you can see the other organizations that are listed there. Uh, and you know, one of the tricky things about th this organization, uh, Ontario Health, is that uh, this merger of 21 agencies um, mostly came into being on December the 2nd. Um, and so again, thinking about sort of where we are as Ontario Health, December the 2nd was when most of these agencies came together, although um, Ontario Telemedicine, uh, the OTN, that, that joined on April 1st. So uh, here we are, uh, June, whatever day of June we are. Um, and so just a couple months ago, uh, Ontario Telemedicine joined. So we are a very, very new organization. Uh, you can see the, the stats on uh, uh, throughout. I won't walk you through all those different uh, pieces. Um, a big responsibility is transfer payments, $25 billion that we uh, uh, manage and get out into, uh, into the field, an operating budget a little over uh, $6 billion. Um, so lots of different components uh, to Ontario Health and lots of different things that we're going to try to pull together. Uh, in particular, uh, we've got the uh, home care system. And if you can give me a flip there, uh, Genevieve. Uh, our home care uh, system and home care, uh, home and community care is, is a big part of Ontario Health. Um, and uh, so we run the, the home care services. And now uh, for many who are on, the, on, the, on this call may know that what we really do largely is subcontract that work out. Um, we subcontract out largely to um, um, private for-profit or not-for-profit agencies who deliver home care. Although we do do some direct service programs um, and they, we've got them uh, listed there uh, and certainly a number of uh, partnerships uh, that have been developed and the same concept of, of care pathways, which is very similar to this concept of uh, clinical guidance. Uh, so a big organization um, that's just getting started uh, and in an organization that we're um, sort of finding our feet on. Uh, if you can give me the next slide there, please, Genevieve. Uh, so um, I was asked to talk about the vision of Ontario Health. Um, and right now, uh, I would say uh, we're, we're working on that. Um, you know, there was the concepts uh, on that first page, uh, the, the ministry vision of bringing all these agencies together into one agency that will provide sort of guidance and oversight uh, to our healthcare system. And, and sure enough, those are, are certainly parts of Ontario Health and, and where we want to go with uh, as, as a system. Um, but I thought I would put some of these uh, concepts in front of you today as we think about what's going to happen for Ontario Health. So Ontario Health right now, as I said, is 21 agencies. We largely still function as 21 separate agencies underneath an umbrella agency. Uh, and you know, no, no criticism on that. We, we just came together uh, uh, in, on December the 2nd in many ways. Um, and then they have a brand new CEO who's spent the last little while uh, trying to help uh, the province uh, in the fight against COVID. So we are where we should be, uh, where you would expect us to be in, in uh, coming together. Uh, one of the first things we're going to do is put together uh, a strategy, a strategic plan, and it'll have vision, mission, values, all those uh, uh, concepts to it. And I thought what I would do here is just put a few things on the table in terms of uh, the first three being some thoughts uh, about what will be core um, to, to what will be uh, in the vision for uh, Ontario Health. And then, and then a question at the bottom that, that I think Ontario Health is going to have to grapple with. Um, and, and by the way, where we happen to be in our uh, cycle right now, you're learning more with the CEO of Ontario Health than some of Ontario Health is. Uh, uh, being so new, um, I'm still meeting uh, many, of the, many of our 12,000 team members and sharing these kinds of ideas with them. Um, but uh, a couple things that I would point out on this slide. Number one is integration, and that really wouldn't be a surprise. Uh, uh, I think perhaps where we will be a bit surprising is um, how aggressively can we push on the concept of integration and true 
health system integration. Um, and I'm going to talk about Ontario health teams in, in, in a moment. Um, but this idea that the health teams embody, this in, idea of having um, all services uh, truly wrapped around the patient and stop me. For those of you who have been around the healthcare system for a while, stop me if you've heard this before, right? We're going to have all of our services wrapped around the person. Uh, we really do need to do that. We need to do that from um, not only in the traditional healthcare services, uh, so think primary care and hospital care, uh, but certainly in the other healthcare services like home care, uh, like long term care, um, but also social services. Uh, so how do we hook up with community social services largely that are provided by others, uh, in particular uh, municipalities or regions? Um, and so when we're thinking about integration, um, really, uh, first off, I would say maybe a little broader than we thought about before. How do we bring the social services in and, and make that a, a little broader? Um, and I would also say a little crisper. Um, we have some wonderful examples of integration all across the province uh, in, in all kinds of uh, jurisdictions. Oftentimes they are based off of MOUs, uh, uh, memorandums of understanding, and they're a little bit loose. How do we make that a little tighter? And how do we make these really enduring integrated systems moving forward? Um, and, and at what scale will we do that? So I think that's going to be a, a critical part of the vision uh, that comes out of uh, Ontario Health and the strategic plan. Uh, the second one, um, again, you know, stop me if you've heard it before, we're going to be really focused on the patient. Um, we really do need to. Uh, it's going to be a little different. Um, I think what we have to do is uh, start where the patient is, uh, where the resident or the client um, or the citizen is. You know, uh, 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 someone just recently reminded me that um, the most cost effective uh, uh, patient is the one who never needs to see a doctor. Um, so it's that citizen, it's a, how do we keep everybody healthy at the beginning of the, all of this journey? How do we sort of move us, our system, our whole system sort of upstream and focus on people as residents um, or as clients or as citizens and perhaps focusing on them before they ever become a patient, um, but truly focusing on their needs. And one of the things that I would say is, is gonna, going to be core to that um, is how do we uh, embed um, patient and family, uh, patient and family uh, and caregiver uh, into our decision making. Um, that's, I would say in Ontario, we're doing okay. Uh, and again, there's some places in Ontario that are doing exceptionally well, um, but as a, as a discipline, I think we still have a, a long way to go. Uh, and then the last bullet point that I put on here uh, is uh, I went with less is more. Um, and um, I'm not actually a believer of that too often, uh, less is less and more is more, um, but uh, I think that there are scenarios where less is more. And what I mean by less is more is um, uh, I think one of the core mandates of Ontario Health and one of the things that my board wants uh, me to push on and one of the main reasons I came into this agency in the first place is we have, because of the very siloed nature of our system and our reporting, we've built up a tremendous amount of overhead. Um, a tremendous amount of overhead inside Ontario Health and, and therefore if you have it inside your funder or your agency, you tend to end up needing a, a receiver of that out in the field. So we, we're, we've got this massive amount of administration over, over the system. Um, and is there a way in which we can really substantially uh, pare that down um, and, and, get the, and take some of that, that challenge and that administrative burden off of the system, all the while respecting the first two bullets, right? Um, and in fact, I would argue that if you do the first two bullets correctly, the third bullet um, almost becomes a byproduct of it, right? If we're far more integrated, if we're thinking of ourselves as a system, not as you know 10 or 12 different parts, but actually one system, the administration of that uh, should be much easier uh, and much clearer. Um, and also, if we're really focusing every time we're asking for a piece of information, uh, every time that we are putting in a rule or a guideline, we start with the question of how does this improve things for the patient? Um, and if we can't answer that, how does this improve things for the client? When we think about our, our community mental health services, how does this improve things for our client? Um, and if we don't see how by asking people to put in a report or submit something, or whatever it is that we're doing on the other side, we can't see a direct line to doing that, then why are we doing it and can we just get rid of it? Um, so those will be some of the main concepts uh, that will drive Ontario Health over the next while. 
One of the questions that I think is, is still in front of, oh, Genevieve is moving along a little too quickly again. I'm still within my 30 minutes, Genevieve. I don't know if you're trying to move me along. As Jonathan say, move, they, they, he's got the headset on. He's saying, move, move along, move along. I, I promise I will finish within the 30 minutes. I, I, I promise. Uh, the, uh, again, I'm giving poor Genevieve a hard time. Uh, just the, uh, uh, we, we practice this for days. Um, the, the population health versus, uh, versus health system. This is going to be a core thing, I think, for uh, Ontario Health to think through um, and, and to get some feedback on from the field. And this is, sort of goes to what ultimately is going to be the measure of Ontario Health. Um, and I would argue um, that um, if you have a measure for Ontario Health, you probably are also measuring your health system just de facto because of the, because of the nature of Ontario Health. So what's the measure? Is the measure going to be a measure around population health? Um, so how healthy is our population and, and truly a measure of outcome? Is that, is that what our measure should be? Um, or uh, should it be a measure about our health system? How well is our health system performing? Um, and this is, I think, a, an important debate um, that we're going to have over the next few months as to where do we want to land on these things? And I would say uh, from an academic esoteric sort of view, I would look at it and say, well, of course it's population health, because at the end of the day, why are we here? The, the whole purpose is to drive the health of the population, right? Reduce the uh, 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 risk for uh, low, worse, uh, low weight babies, reduce smoking. Uh, what are the things, reduce the incidence of diabetes. Um, so this is what our healthcare system is here for. Um, however, in very practical terms, in measurable terms, in the ability to actually link what we're doing to those outcomes, it gets pretty tricky. Um, some of those measures, really, you're only going to see a change over many, many years. Um, and so how would we know in the interim uh, that, in fact, Ontario Health is doing the things that it needs to do? When you think about it in those terms, arguing that what our real goal is, is to have a very high performing healthcare system, perhaps as measured uh, through um, uh, uh, the World Health Organization standards or through the, uh, in comparison to the OECD countries, you know, do we want to set a set of measures that say we are an outstanding world-class healthcare system? Uh, we certainly like to say we are. Um, should we put measures around that and should that be our goal? Um, and, and, and trust that if we are an outstanding health system, the population health uh, and, and the improvement in health in our populations will follow. So those are some of the questions that we're going to be working our way through um, over the next little while. Now we're ready for that next slide, please, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, some sentinel things that we're going to be sorting out uh, in the next short while as well, uh, as we look at um, uh, defining who we are as Ontario Health. Um, the, the first one is, uh, uh, and this is just, uh, there's more, but, but just a, a few that I want to speak about today. Um, one, and I, I've already touched on it, uh, is uh, we do have to complete this merger. Um, we are the bringing together of 21 uh, agencies. Uh, and, you know, uh, for those of you who are more on the business side of healthcare or on the business side, period, um, all the same rules apply in healthcare. We, we like to think that they don't, um, but they do. Uh, we're bringing 21 agencies with 21 different cultures. 21 uh, different ways, uh, 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 rules on benefits and payroll and all those sorts of things. And we've got to merge all of this into one agency that functions as one. Um, and all the things that go along with that and creating a compelling vision and direction uh, for the folks who are part of these 21 agencies. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we have that underway now. Um, it's been a bit of fits and starts uh, because we uh, both because of, of legislation and then of course our friend COVID and all these other things that have sort of gotten in the way. But we have to do this merger. We have to complete this. Uh, right now we are mostly one, but we really need to become truly one over the next little while. Um, so, uh, so that's a challenge for us. Um, our relationship with the Ministry of Health. Um, so uh, this is also going to be something that will need to be defined over the next uh, uh, couple of years. Um, you know, we are uh, uh, the health agency in the province of Ontario. So what does that mean in terms of our relationship to Ministry of Health? What's the, the boundary line? Um, in the uh, legislation that formed us, um, the boundary line between us, very, very clear that ministry develops policy, Ontario Health implements. Um, and if the world was that simple, then this would be very simple. 
Um, but of course, the world isn't always that simple. What's going on out in the field will influence policy. How well things are implemented will influence policy. Policy uh, will influence what are the different things that we're doing and trying to implement out in the field. Um, so how we're going to work together, um, how uh, um, together or separate we're, we're going to be allowed to be um, will also uh, be determined over the next couple of years. Uh, you know, if you think about it in, in, in one sense, we are uh, a, a arm's length agency from the ministry. So what's the value of doing that? Um, and there's there's many theoretical values uh, of, of separating out away from the ministry into, a, into an arm's length agency um, uh, in theory. Uh, in practice, will we see them? Right. You move outside the agency because that will outside of government, because that gives you the ability to hire differently, to hire different people, to explore different things. Will that be true? Um, will we be able to set up our own pay grids? Can I can I do things out in Ontario Health that I'm not allowed to do if I was inside the Ministry of Health? So we'll, we'll test some of that. Uh, I would say uh, that our first test has already come and, and I think we um, if we didn't get a, a, an A, we at least got a B plus, um, and that was with uh, with COVID. We've had to learn very, very rapidly uh, in, in intense situations. How does this division work? What does the Ministry of Health do, and what does uh, uh, what does Ontario Health do? Um, and I, the reason I would give us a B plus, maybe even an A, is uh, it, without really having a detailed guideline, uh, we have a. a an act called the Connecting Care Act, and that's all we had to guide us. We just kind of figured it out in terms of uh, setting up this concept of policy versus implementation. But there's a few places where we continue to trip a little bit um, as we think this one through. Um, and a great example of that would be on digital health. Uh, inside the ministry, there are teams. Um, inside the ministry doing digital. We have teams out in Ontario Health doing digital. So how does that work and how are we going to put these pieces together? Right now, uh, I think it's gone well, but more out of collegiality than it has gone out of us having a clear definition as to what does Ministry of Health do, what does Ontario Health do, and what are the freedoms that Ontario Health has that really makes it worthwhile to have a separate agency outside of government. Because uh, if you can't take advantage of those freedoms, then why did you do it in the first place? Uh, and then the other one that I'll just quickly comment on is relationship with providers. Um, and uh, this is where we have to work with, uh, there's um, uh, about 650 long-term care homes, um, over, our, over 100, about 115, I think, uh, hospitals. Uh, I don't even know how many uh, primary care docs there are out there and, and, and whether they're solo practitioners or they're part of large groups. The list goes on. We have uh, um, uh, community support service agencies, uh, mental, community mental health agencies, uh, and so on. And so there's just a lot of players in the system um, and we have to think about what role do we play and at the end of the day, um, how do we make them stronger? Uh, and when I think about all this, um, remember uh, my point, uh, my midpoint, the, the middle bullet point on the previous slide um, should be all about the patient or the resident or the client or the citizen. So when we think about defining our relationship to the providers, how are we doing that that is actually making it better for the patient or better for the citizen? Um, and when we put that lens on it, I would say we've got a lot of work to do. Um, in many ways, many of the agencies uh, that we've inherited um, have been more about administration, and I don't mean that in an editorial negative way, it's just what it is, it's administration. It's making sure that the forms that got uh, created over here in the ministry flow through and get out to the providers they sign them and then back they go through the agency. We check to the boxes to make sure that they're all there and then boom back into the government again. Sure, it makes it efficient perhaps, um, but it's not really about making the providers stronger um, and, and enabling them to provide better care uh, to the patient, to the resident, um, uh, to the client or to the citizen. So uh, a lot has to be determined um, and a lot has to be earned as well. Um, I would say uh, that in these, in these scenarios, and this is true of the Ministry of Health, true with the providers. Um, there's no, in, the, the worst thing you can do is, is force people to do stuff, right? To sign to say, 
uh, you know, under this circumstance, and, and this would happen to me when I would be, uh, when I was at the Lynn, uh, I was at Toronto Central Lynn many years ago, um, and I can't remember there was an ex what the exact occurrence was, but uh, an occurrence happened um, at a hospital, uh, and we found out about it a couple of days later, and the feeling was we should call that hospital and chastise them because under the rules, they were supposed to call us. Um, my belief is, is that uh, if we're going to be this central agency, we have to earn that call. There has to be a reason, a value add reason for the patient or the client um, or the, uh, the citizen or the resident. There needs to be a value add reason why that provider would call us. And if there's no value add reason, don't make them call us. Um, that's just bureaucracy. Um, so we've got a lot to figure out between in, in our relationship with our providers. You want the next slide? And Genevieve is like, she's just never going to jump ahead again. She's going to wait, right, right, right till the bitter end. Got it. Uh, wanted to just spend a minute on, on integration and I'm just getting close to my half hour. So I'm, and I get a couple more slides, two more slides that I would like to do. Um, so on integration, um, I would say that the first is, is you may have heard about Ontario Health Teams. Um, and so this was uh, an effort um, early on uh, uh, before COVID. Uh, uh, and um, I guess, BC, look at that. Uh, so uh, 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 before COVID, and um, the idea was was to have the province self-identify into a number of um, smaller regions, um, and that these regions uh, would bring together all the healthcare providers within the region, um, and they would function as a single system and become ultimately uh, go through a bundled payment model where all of their funding would flow through a single payment down into the agencies and then and then the agencies would, would spread it out across uh, across themselves. Uh, loosely built off of, for those of you who are in the program and maybe have been studying um, ACOs, accountable care organizations down in the US, a very similar type of model, a lead agency funding goes down and then they essentially subcontract uh, to the other agencies. Um, and uh, so a great idea, a great idea. Um, in very early days uh, before COVID hit, although some, and I can't remember the number now, I think that we approved somewhere in the neighborhood of between 20 to 30 of these things across the province. A handful of them are very, very mature and are working very well. Um, most of them did a little bit of pause when, when we headed into COVID, um, and we'll, we'll come back and look at that in a moment. Um, but so that we had these Ontario health teams. And the idea is, is that these Ontario health teams would report up into Ontario health. Um, and so the funding model, the, the funding policies would be done over at ministry, it would come into Ontario Health, Ontario Health would then fund these Ontario Health teams and there would be a, a relationship back and forth between the Ontario Health team and, and Ontario Health and presumably in this Ontario Health team would be your provider agencies, uh, your hospitals and your primary care and all sorts of stuff. So we'll see, it's, a, it's an ambitious agenda um, and uh, uh, there's a lot to like about it, um, but we've got some work to do. I've listed the other areas on here for system integration, and I could have gone on and on. I could have thrown hospitals on there, community mental health. I just wanted to pull out a few. I would say that these are the four that right now are on the front burner, so to speak, on uh, what does integration really look like when we're talking about system integration. Um, certainly, I'm sure everybody on this uh, on this event um, uh, is aware of what's going on in our long-term care homes, uh, and uh, it, it's it's gone from uh, big challenge to, to absolute tragedy. Um, and so uh, a, a big question in front of government right now, um, and, and I'm pondering myself, I don't have the answers, um, is what, what to do about long-term care, um, which largely has been outside of the system, um, and how what would be an appropriate way to, to integrate uh, uh, long-term care more into the system. Is there a better way to do it? Is there a way to do it? And is it a way that's going to bring value uh, to to uh, the residents? Um, primary care, uh, a huge challenge with primary care. Um, you know, uh, uh, any model of care, any any system of health care really needs to start with primary care as its focus, in my opinion. Um, a big challenge there because we have so many different funding models and so many different setups all across the province. Some areas of primary care is in the province are very well organized. Others, it's still a lot of single shingle docs. 
very difficult for us to work with primary care as a sector. So how do we how do we move that forward? And frankly, if we don't move it forward, I don't know how we're going to make really, really stellar gains on the efficiency of our healthcare system, and particularly in the areas of, of including population health. Uh, public health has been uh, in the spotlight uh, through uh, this experience with COVID. Um, that's, as we know, most of public health is delivered very, very locally. Um, I think in most instances uh, that works extremely well. Um, when we're trying to do mass coordination, it's been a, more of a challenge. So we're, we're, what, what can we do there? Um, and by the way, across the province, we've seen where public health has integrated very, very nicely or worked in partnership is probably the better words, very, very nicely with the local healthcare system. And we've seen really great outcomes. Uh, Kingston would be a great example where public health, hospital care, primary care, they're all working very, very closely together. And we've seen really stellar outcomes in that community. So, so how can we incent that a little more? And then home and community care, as I mentioned, home and community care, or at least the commissioning of home and community care, all sits back with Ontario Health. And, and we're this gigantic central agency. So, so why is it sitting over here when you've got all of the system working over here? And, and is there a better way to do that? So lots to work on on system integration. And on to our next slide. There we go. Second to last slide. I just wanted to end, um, had to end with uh, COVID and I'm going to do a quick next steps after this and then and then turn it over uh, to Jonathan. Um, I, I would say uh, uh, there's a lot to unpack on COVID and happy to, to talk in more detail. I just wanted to, to, to call out a few very simple points. One is, is that um, we've seen um, tremendous, uh, in many instances, heroic performances from um, our, or our institutions and more importantly, our caregivers. Um, our frontline care providers are second to none in the world, and, uh, and they've demonstrated that time and again uh, through uh, through what's gone on with COVID. And whether it's uh, through their agencies, you know, uh, uh, often it's been through their agencies, but we've also seen their commitment to leave their agency and go work in other places, whether it's leave the hospital and go work in the long-term care home, um, working out in the community. Uh, this is an incredible commitment beyond their organization and to the people of Ontario and to what they've committed to. So this is a tremendous strength for us. Our healthcare workers are absolutely fantastic and have made the difference uh, in our COVID uh, challenges. Um, our silos did become chasms um, and these are our cracks in our in our system where we've had these silos, many of which I just uh, referenced on the previous page. They really got exaggerated uh, through this pandemic response. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we're going to have to square up at the end of this is that um, by most measures, uh, the Ontario healthcare system, when compared to the other provinces, performs extremely well. Um, if you look at through uh, CIHI or any of those measures, we perform extremely well. Um, but we've really struggled through this pandemic because we are all these different pieces. Now, we've risen above it because of the first two bullet points. Um, and, and overall have done a, a very, very strong response uh, to COVID. Um, but we have to learn from these lessons and, and the siloed nature of, and which perhaps contributed to our strength as competitive organizations pushing each other um, to be that much stronger and that much more innovative, that maybe has become a bit of our weakness now. And is there a way in which we can be more integrated, but still hold on to those things that have made us exceptional? I and mean, I think that's gonna be our next challenge. And so finally, our uh, last slide, uh, our next steps from here. Uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things uh, uh, just to say, um, and I'll, I'll point out to Genevieve, there's a question at the bottom there, Genevieve, so we're gonna, we're gonna hang on there. The, uh, a couple of bullet points on this is that um, in terms of what's gonna be happening at, at Ontario Health in the very, very near future, uh, as in right now, um, we're definitely thinking about, uh, you know, wave one isn't completely done yet. We still have a little, the remnants of wave one, more than the remnants of wave one still present in Ontario and we're supporting um, everybody uh, on, on that. Um, but we also have to think about wave two. Um, we have to get our schools open and we have to keep them open. Um, so what are the things that we need to be putting in place to do that? Um, and we, we've got to be quick. We, we've got a few months, uh, hopefully. Uh, to make sure that we are well prepared for wave two and it does not have the impact that wave one had, which from a health perspective, you know, generally we did okay. We did tragically in, in long-term care, but generally we did okay on from a health perspective, but look what the impact was on our economy and on our society. And, you know, we can't do that for an entire year. So we've got to make sure we've got the things in place and get those schools open, keep them open and keep our society up and functioning. 
meanwhile, while we're doing that, uh, inside Ontario Health, we've got to do our functional integration. We've got to complete that merger uh, and get ourselves focusing. Um, and then the last point there with the little question mark beside it is, is that our hope is, is to develop the strategy that I started with at the beginning of this uh, in terms of pulling together a, a clear view as to what Ontario Health wants to deliver. Might be a bit of a challenge when you get when you put bullet points one and two together, uh, how much strategic planning we're going to be able to do. Hopefully we'll be able to do all three, um, but if one has to go, it might be the strategy. We may have to hold off on that a little bit as we get the other two things under control. And with that, Jonathan and Genevieve, you've been great. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it back to Jonathan for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Is that an echo? <laughs> Hopefully that goes away. Um, we got lots of questions that have been uh, presented to me, which is uh, unfortunate for me because I had all sorts of questions myself. Um, we're still getting that echo. Are we good? Okay, it's gone. Excellent. Um, so, but I will uh, I will curb my questions and ask the ones that have been provided. A number were provided before the registration. So, if you uh, put your questions in the queue, um, uh, in the Q and A, uh, there are other questions I'm, I'm also going to be pulling from. So, uh, I hope we can get to as many as possible. Um, uh, the first question, uh, obviously, COVID nineteen is on everybody's mind. So. Um, as you were involved, uh, as much as you were involved in the uh, decisions around how we responded to COVID-19, and you looked around the world and you saw different uh, approaches, whether it be uh, uh, South Korea or Taiwan or Sweden or other European countries, how, uh, how was uh, that decision made and how did you uh, discount some approaches versus others? Uh, There you go. Uh, I, can you hear me okay? Yep, good. Um, yeah, so great question. I would say that um, um, we certainly relied on um, uh, evidence from other countries. Um, we also looked at, we had a, a group called our science table um, who helped inform us uh, quite a bit. Uh, they were from a different university whose name I won't mention and are far, far inferior to the University of Ottawa, just to say. Um, although I think there was a few people from Ottawa on that. It was a pan-provincial group. I can't remember all the folks who were on it. At any rate, so, so it's a little bit of, a, uh, I guess, three things. One is, is that we would be looking at the evidence of what's going on in the other, in the other countries and what could we learn. And that was more in a gestalt sort of way and a, you know, reviewing articles and reviewing that which was in the public domain. Um, second is, is that we did have a science group who were running models for us um, and as much as possible. And I would you know, just say that when you're dealing with a disease as young as this one, um, to talk about evidence is a little sketchy, right? Uh, you've only got a few months worth. And, and certainly when we think about it, going into the third bucket, which was uh, understanding what interventions worked in other countries and would those interventions work here, which gets into societal norms as much as anything else. When we think about uh, how did, what, what uh, restrictions would you put on? How would the communities respond to those restrictions? Um, and all of it off of a, a relatively small evidence set. So this really was bring those three things together um, to sort of direct uh, where we could go. Um, and uh, from there, uh, we, we looked at the different parts of the system um, and largely tried to do what we could, certainly the lessons of uh, the social isolation uh, and, and keeping, um, putting in the public health measures, which I think were quite successful. And I would have to say, uh, as Ontarians, uh, thank goodness Canadians are, are good rule followers um, because we largely followed the rules um, and uh, without the, the harsh restrictions of other countries, um, and that made a huge difference for us. So it's really bringing those three things together, trying to make it as science-based as possible, recognizing um, that the science was being made up as we went. Um, and I would point out as a matter, uh, just as, a, as an example, in, in late January, early February, there was little science that said that people would be asymptomatic. Um, the, the general consensus at that time was that uh, if you had uh, COVID, you had symptoms. And if you did not have symptoms, you did not have COVID. And of course, we've learned that that is absolutely not the case. Um, and we've had more and more evidence as that has gone on. So, you know, we, we've had to roll with, as the science has, has, has emerged and gotten stronger, we've had to, to roll with that. 
Fair enough. Yeah, and not easy decisions to make for sure. Um, perhaps you could talk to uh, what was your primary learning through that uh, COVID response and perhaps what was your biggest surprise? Um, I, th I think that the, the um, I'm only pausing because there were so many. Um, I, I think what I would say is, is, and it sort of goes back a little bit to uh, my presentation, on, on the learning was um, how big the gaps are in our system from an integration perspective. I, I, because the system is strained, and I, and I wonder if there's any system engineers here or, or any system PhDs on the phone, if, if this is true in, in other organisms, but you know, when everything is running smoothly, that distance, that relative distance, um, we, 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 uh, we, we don't feel it as much. And, and largely that, that relative distance is made up by the patients themselves, right? So, so what I'm thinking is, uh, as an example, is you know, that, that ability to, to move from primary care to hospital, to, to an emergency room and back into primary care in your home, that, that th those transitions, um, and th the gap in the, that care, uh, in that care continuum, in non-stressed environments, um, we, we manage it. It's not, it's not a beautiful thing, but we manage it. Um, uh, those gaps got so exaggerated when we got into COVID, um, and, and more so than I would have really been anticipating uh, in terms of how that goes. So I think coming out this other side, uh, we, we need to be... Um, uh, we need to take a hard look at the Ontario system and can we close some of those gaps in a very concrete way in the next few months um, so that they're not they're not um, uh, quite so extreme. Um, and, and I would say that was both what I learned and, and what I was surprised by. Um, you know, so I kind of answered both questions in one, but, but I would say, I, I don't think I would say that I was, th this comment isn't so much surprised as um, maybe pleasantly surprised, maybe pleasantly reinforced. Um, the reaction of our frontline care providers and their willingness to go into uh, very, very troubling situations that were of not of their making, um, but because people were suffering, they went. Um, and um, so I don't know that I'm surprised by that, but I, I was certainly uh, heartwarmed by it um, and impressed by the, the people that we call our, our healthcare workers here in, in Ontario. Is there something you would have done differently uh, based on your four months experience? Uh, with COVID or with Ontario Health or just in general? Based on my five months, my difference is I may not have taken this job. That was <laughs> the, big, the big difference that I may have done. Uh, so uh, is, it, is it specifically, Jonathan, can you refine the question a little bit for me? Uh, I could try. Um, the The questioner was not specific as okay. to whether this is COVID related or not. Yeah, I guess I guess what I would say um, uh, over the four months, I don't know that I. I, I mean, with twenty twenty hindsight, uh, I would say uh, we would have ramped up um, testing of healthcare workers, particularly in long term care homes and in other congregate settings, faster. Um, we, we know that the main transmitter of COVID uh, in those in congregate settings are, are tend to be the workers, um, and uh, we we I, I would say we would want to do that more aggressively, and, and we're examining that now um, through the summer. We're we're testing different models of testing um, to to figure out what is the best way for us to as best as possible ensure that we've got um, healthy workers going in, and I would say you know. The, the epidemiologists in the world, uh, uh, there's lots of debate about the, the relative value of surveillance testing and prospective testing. Um, at the end of the day, from my perspective, uh, while, while we, we understand that um, testing in and of itself uh, is no panacea for ensuring the absence of this particular disease, uh, it's just one tool that, again, helps to reduce risk. Uh, and in congregate settings, what we've uh, seen, we've seen worldwide, and we certainly saw it here in Ontario, once COVID gets in to one of those uh, settings, uh, it spreads and it's very, very difficult to get it under control afterwards. So even if it's only reducing risk by, by not a quantum, but by degree, uh, it's still worth it. Um, and, and I would say that we need to be, we will be far more aggressive on that um, uh, next time around. Thank you. Um, that, that brings us really to a, a set of questions. Uh, a lot of people are asking about uh, what you foresee as changes to the long-term care setting 
Um, now that COVID has highlighted some of the shortfalls, we're thinking particularly of uh, the lack of full-time staff, the understaffing, um, uh, the four-person ward rooms, those kind of things. Uh, I, I know you mentioned this in your presentation that you, you don't have the answers yet, but are there thoughts that you have on that those issues? Yeah, and I would say that um, recognizing they are, uh, as you just described, they're my thoughts. Um, I'm not uh, uh, long-term care. Uh, uh, strictly speaking, Ontario Health has a relatively small role uh, in the long-term care system, um, but I've been kind enough, uh, or people have been kind enough to invite me in um, to, to share my thoughts on, on various things. Um, I think that uh, there, there is a long list of things that we need to do uh, to uh, really support um, long-term care better. Um, the things that I think we need to focus on immediately, uh, the, the capital infrastructure, you mentioned the four bedrooms, that's a big one. That is a really big challenge um, and it's not so easy. We looked very early on as to uh, basically decanting strategies, right? Um, could we decant um, uh, a residents out of uh, uh, these long-term care homes? The big challenge became to where? Um, and, and would it be safer uh, in that other environment? And we looked at retirement homes as a, for instance, um, some trickiness there, because we may be bringing COVID into another congregate setting. So we're moving, <laughs> we're moving COVID from one congregate setting and putting it in a different one, um, albeit largely a safer one because uh, the retirement home ostensibly has single rooms, uh, but you're still moving a disease into another place and we have to be very careful. Doing that ahead of time, if we can confirm the absence of disease, and, and we can mostly do that, uh, that might be an option. Uh, we looked at hotels, uh, that became a non-starter fairly quickly. Um, you know, if you think about the people who are in our long-term care homes, uh, these are, are generally, these are people who are very ill. Uh, generally, these are people who are suffering uh, some from various forms of dementia. And generally, these are people who um, are not pro pro uh, particularly mobile. So immediately you would get into situations um, like uh, you know, to get the people in and out of beds, you need Hoyer lifts. You don't have lifts in hotels. Uh, you need to be able to put the wheelchair, their wheelchair must be able to go into the washroom. Many of the, the uh, a hotel's washroom doorway is not wide enough for, for, a, uh, for a wheelchair and on it goes. So, so decanting out of long-term care uh, is something I, I, we haven't given up on, but, but uh, it's first blush as to how quickly could we do it. Um, there were a lot of lessons uh, there. Uh, second is, is that we definitely, and, and these aren't in order of priority, just stream of consciousness. Uh, second would be um, the, uh, the health human resources factor. Uh, uh, these were homes, many of them were struggling in the first place uh, with, uh, uh, for um, staff, uh, for team members. Um, you throw in there then that uh, somebody got sick. You throw in there that people are afraid to go into a place where someone got sick. Um, uh, so you can, get, you can get yourself into staffing challenges very, very rapidly. Um, we uh, uh, started up a provincial staffing model to try to, to build on that. I think what we would be doing, among other things, um, over the course of the summer is really beefing that up um, and getting more and more of a roster of folks who are trained and able to go into these settings. Uh, many of these settings weren't ready from a uh, PPE perspective um, and so uh, for, uh, protective equipment. Uh, that one we've largely uh, we, we've addressed and we, and we can address, so we would make sure that that uh, is the case as well. I, I would say the more fundamental for me, and, and mentioned it in my in my talk, is is there a way that we can make the long term care homes much more part of an integrated system? Um, and you know, bringing doctors and nurses in, um, uh, or and, and other medical professionals in after COVID has already taken hold. Sure, they they can provide a lot of support, but is there are there ways in which we can take some of those principles, those clinical principles and IPAC and all that sort of stuff and build that in up front and have an integrated relationship between the hospital and the long term care homes in, in their communities and primary care and the long term care homes in their communities uh, and do that in a little bit more of a standardized expectation way. I think that that for me personally, I think that might be uh, uh, one of the big triggers. Don't know how to do that yet, um, and uh, but it's certainly something I would like to explore. Um, it's going to be up to others to decide if we're going to explore that, but that would be something that I think we really need to explore. And I assume that would apply for home care as well. Uh, for sure, you know, the thing that we're uh, going back to our lessons learned um, from all of this, we didn't do a great job of um, really uh, supporting and beefing up home care 
um, and, and really supporting and beefing up primary care. Um, if you think about the nature of this disease, the last thing you want to do is put people into any kind of institutional care. Um, the, the risks uh, uh, go up um, from them uh, uh, with respect to the spread. Um, so uh, we certainly want to make sure and, and look at how uh, we actually saw a decline um, in, in home care um, over this period. Now, part of that um, was people who uh, are are receiving sort of low intensity home care. Um, so think more of our, of our wonderful PSWs and, you know, the people who are receiving, um, uh, there's a term for it that's just escaping me at the moment. Uh, ADLs is the, uh, you know, we use acronyms for everything in healthcare. Um, uh, activities of daily living. I got it. Activities of daily living. Uh, and so these are, you know, laundry and groceries and uh, dishes and all that sort of stuff. So we saw a big reduction in those things, mainly because the uh, the client was nervous about having somebody coming into their home um, and, and, and understandable. Um, so uh, A, uh, what did we learn from that? Um, can, we, can we do that a little bit differently? And most importantly, can we build confidence for people that the person coming into their home, it's safe to have that person come into their home because not only would they be coming in and, uh, you know, my father-in-law uh, received home care services for many, many years and the people who are coming into the, his home who were seeing him every day or every second day, they would know well in advance how his health was. Um, and so we could get early warnings from them. And so it's not so much that, that yes, yeah, so fine, maybe he wasn't getting his laundry done, but the bigger impact is nobody's checking in on him. Right? Nobody's doing that check to say, you know what, he, he, uh, things aren't looking so good and doing a call back to the care coordinator to say, you know, my client here, uh, he's, he's been complaining about or whatever, and then let's get some medical care for him while he's in the home. So we've lost that bit and we have to find a way to get that back because keeping people in their homes with extra services, um, they're more comfortable, it's safer, and in a COVID world, it's, it's safer for everybody. So, uh, but we have to build up that confidence that they'll allow those home care workers into their homes. I got some math models if you want about uh, our lack of uh, capacity in the subacute system I can uh, share with you later. <laughs> All right, sounds good. <laughs> um, uh, onto a different question. Um, what is the plan for the health teams to address the strategic importance of staff engagement in the planning, scheduling, and deployment of critical clinical resources? Wow. Uh, can you give me that one again? Sure. Uh, what is the plan for health teams to address the strategic importance of staff engagement in the planning, scheduling, and deployment of critical clinical resources? That feels like there's a whole bunch of things wrapped into that question. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, uh, try to tackle that as best I can with respect to the, the, the scheduling elements of that. I think maybe where that question is going is, um, you know, uh, as a sector, uh, we've had some really we continue to struggle um, with uh, team engagement. Um, uh, people are feeling very, very stretched and very burnt out. And that was before COVID. Um, and so, you know, I think a big part of that, so there's all kinds of staffing models and, and things. I, I'm going to skip that for the moment and, and just go to, I think that this really speaks to, um, actually, I will tie it into the question from before, Jonathan, and to your comments about um, uh, in the, in the subacute land, do we have the right people in the right places doing the right things? Um, and oftentimes what we're doing is we are overloading into particular job classifications and moving everybody to the highest job classification um, uh, for for the from a need perspective, even though they don't need to be there, um, and finding some balance back into uh, so again, just I'll use the example that we were just talking about, um, finding balance back to keeping people healthier, and in the in the scenario that I just described of the PSW who's interacting with uh, with the client. Um, you know, the next immediate step might be for that person, the PSW and that person to be able to access a nurse practitioner um, and get the nurse practitioner involved. So before we send uh, our poor client off to the emergency room and start that entire cycle um, and all the challenges that were going on there, and let's not forget that before COVID, we had very significant challenges in our emergency rooms. Um, before we even go down that path, is there a way in which we can um, triage quickly what's going on in the home or in other care settings. Long-term care is another great example of uh, understanding what's happening and bringing the right level of resource 
to the to the client or, or to the patient um, at the right time and try to stop this constant ex escalation up into the acute care sector uh, where we're, where we see uh, a whole bunch of constraints coming in and start to overwhelm. So I don't know if I'm anywhere close to answering the question that was brought up, but to my mind, this idea of, of uh, workload balance and critical resources, um, making sure that the right type of resource is being used at the right level, um, I think is part of the answer um, and something that only comes when we think about ourselves as an integrated whole and not as uh, individual silos. Absolutely. Uh, the, the question had underlined strategic importance of staff engagement. So I, I'm thinking the question uh, had more to do with the, the worry that as you create these teams that, that the uh, maybe the frontline staff uh, don't have the same ability to engage. Yeah. So thanks for that clarification. And I know we're almost, uh, are we till three? Are we till three? Huh? 330. 330. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, yeah. I'll forever then. The, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so let me pick on that one a little bit on the staff engagement. I think, you know, um, I, I don't know if I have an answer that won't come across as a bit trite. Um, uh, the, the reality is, is that the true answers, the best answers to the system, to our problems come from uh, proper engagement of the front line, the people who are actually doing the, the, the work. Um, it, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we don't do that very well as a system. Um, some of it has to do with we don't even really know how to do that well. Um, some of it comes from those frontline folks are uh, so busy um, that even engaging them properly um, becomes a big challenge. Uh, and you know the, the, the classic story uh, of, of um, the misalignment in, in engagement in our healthcare system is that um, you know guys like me who I, I do meetings virtually all day every day. Um, and so setting up a meeting with me at four o'clock in the afternoon, you're probably booking it three months out, but uh, uh, you know, I'm used to a meeting at, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon. Try getting a physician or, or a nurse uh, into a, a sitting down at a table to talk at two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it's not reasonable. Um, so then it's about, well, really the best way to, to do that engagement um, is at six o'clock in the evening. Um, the problem then becomes, uh, well, these are very overworked people and even for myself, you know, every once in a while you like to be home with your family. So now you're asking these clinicians to either give up some of their work time, uh, which is already overburdened and many of them are, are being asked for, to, to do more with less in their work environment or give up some of their family time, uh, both of which have a very, very high cost. So I appreciate, although uh, although I know that the I, I know that, that the textbook answer uh, is that we must engage our frontline folks. They're the people who know the answers. That's absolutely true. Um, how we do that is far harder because of the circumstances that we're operating under. Um, and even in some environments that I've been in, um, and some of the environments that I've actually uh, led, the answer has been, well, great. What we'll do is is that we will um, hire more people. Um, and bring more people into the environment uh, so that it frees up these people um, so that they are now free to participate in whatever is the planning activity or the design activity that we're doing. That's also a lovely theory. The challenge is, is that we're running vacancies in most of our areas. So we can even put the funding there and it's still difficult to find the folks. All that to say, I, I don't want to say that we can't do it. It, it must be done. Um, and we have to find ways to do it. And, and frankly, uh, we have to get a little more comfortable with the tools that we're on right now, this Teams tool. Uh, there are other ways uh, in healthcare that we can uh, get that feedback. Um, but I, I only want to recognize that while I give you all the trite answers, uh, there's some real real challenges underneath that have to be overcome because you do have to get to the, to the right answer, which is that they have to be involved. No, I appreciate, I appreciate the honesty there. Um, there are also a number of questions uh, around the the, the the choice that was made um, uh, towards the, system, the the revamping of the system, and other provinces have gone to a regional health system. Um, and the question is, why did Ontario choose uh, not to go that route? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I would say, um, I, I guess a, a few a few observations. Um, so. Uh, Ontario has tried the Ontario version of regionalization um, and uh, that has been largely keep the agency's structures in place and then try to put some kind of overhead on top of it. And in fact, that's kind of what we're doing right now with Ontario Health and Ontario Health has five regions and we work out into the field. 
Um, and so let's just pause on that for a second and we'll look at um, uh, across the provinces um, what's happened with regionalization. Uh, first is, is that um, it's, it's morphed over time um, and largely it started with more and, and then became less, um, almost like my slides, less is more. Um, so it's, it sort of started with, with more regions and, and that sort of devolved down into fewer regions. Um, Alberta um, is sort of the, uh, um, the bellwether of a single region, right? It's just all of Alberta Health reports into Alberta Health um, a, 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 as a single system. You can get into long academic arguments about which model is better. Um, and, uh, I, you know, for those of us in Ontario, uh, we would point to particularly our hospital system. We would say that, you know, uh, we have the lowest cost per rated case. Uh, we have a tremendous clinical turnaround times. We have tremendous clinical outcomes. Show me the evidence, the hard evidence that these regional models are actually more effective um, than, uh, than uh, the Ontario model where we're largely um, still our separate agencies with just sort of a soft regional model on top of it. Um, my personal view uh, is, is that that's more to do with we're, we're measuring the wrong things than it is about uh, that the measurements are telling us that we shouldn't do more regionalization. Um, uh, I happen to believe that we should move into much more of a regional model. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, I tend to stay away from the, the hardcore governance discussions. I think that those are, you know, one of the big challenges that we get into in Ontario um, and probably in every jurisdiction, but, but certainly here in Ontario, is um, we uh, uh, function follows form. Um, we, we worry first about governance. We start at governance um, as compared to start with the patient. Um, and start with the resident. Um, and when we start there, would you design the system the way that it is right now? And largely, you would get into uh, how you need to um, move to, you'd, you'd start to describe all the things that you need to do for this person. And I believe that what you would start to describe is much more of a regional model. Um, and, you know, uh, to sort of bore the people who, if you're not bored already, the people who were uh, uh, on my uh, chat this morning, you know, there's a reason why I moved to, uh, just before this job, I was at Lake Ridge Health. Um, and Lake Ridge Health, Lake Ridge basically runs all the hospitals except one small hospital. It runs all the hospitals in Durham, in Durham region. Um, and what that meant to me as an opportunity is how can we create an experience for the residents of Durham where their social services, which were largely run and funded by the regional or the municipality, where their social services and their health services, which is largely funded by the province, can actually function as though it's one system. My belief is, is that um, uh, you can go a long way without ever touching governance. Um, and I'm not arguing, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, uh, in, a, in a, um, a zealot on there can only be one governance or, or there must be multiple governance. Again, for me, I think that that has to come out of uh, out of your local conditions um, and holding the, the person and the patient first. I would say that um, if you don't move to a full single governance model the way that uh, the other regions have done, you know, in BC, they've got their regions, etc., cetera, um, then you're going to have to have some very clear, strong, uh, contracts uh, between agencies to uh, truly embed an integrated model that has multiple governance structures in it um, can be done a little tricky and frankly is a little against the culture that we have in our healthcare systems. Um, uh, largely, uh, we do a lot off of uh, mutual agreement um, and we, we sort of shy away a little bit from hardcore contracts that say this is these are the things you're going to do and these are the things that I'm going to do. Um, and, uh, but I think if you're going to have a regional model uh, without actually merging all the agencies, you're going to have to embrace the idea of these very, very strong contracts that are going to be in between the agencies. One of the flaws in that and one of the challenges is that uh, you're, um, uh, what are the penalties if you um, don't honor that agreement? And unfortunately in our history, when we build out these things, the penalty, the, the agency or the person that actually suffers is the patient, not the agencies that are left behind. So, so there's some flaws in that as well. 
So at the end of the day, I would say uh, uh, Ontario uh, has resisted. I can't speak to why Ontario made the decisions that they've made. Um, I have my, my guesses, but those would just be guesses. Um, I would say that where we are right now, um, uh, we should be focusing on um, definitely on sub-region models as we talk about with the concept of the OHTs. Um, look at the ACO model, uh, which is what we're doing. And, and the ACO model, uh, the accountable care organization model, is trying to embrace the concept that don't start with governance, start with an outcome and a funding model and figure out what the, what the governance structure will look like to move that funding model into the outcome that you're looking for. Worked with to some degree in the US for sure. Um, maybe that's something that's gonna be successful here in Ontario. Yeah, certainly I, I'm, as a, a user of the health system, I think the idea of starting with the patient makes sense. Um, and I, it leads really into the next question, um, which is concerned with the, the significant amount of healthcare costs that are associated with direct treatment of chronic health conditions, uh, many of which are preventable. Uh, so what role do you see Ontario Health playing in health promotion, disease prevention, and ultimately lifestyle medicine? Mm -hmm. uh, so great question, and, and, and it sort of goes to uh, 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 my slide earlier on about are we about population health um, or are we about a high performing healthcare system um, and it's a nuanced difference as I described in the chart um, but it's, it's an important one it's, it's one that we're going to have to grapple with um, uh, my hope um, is that uh, and, and my desire from a from a leadership perspective on Ontario health is we want to move upstream as far as we possibly can um, and you know the good news is is that um, um, in, in, in a weird sort of way, uh, having so much demand for service, we can really start to uh, reorganize uh, without there being a, a an agency or a provider group that quote loses, right? Um, now this isn't necessarily true across all the province, and let me just unpack this a little bit. So in high growth areas, so if you think about um, in uh, Durham region as a for instance. It's a very, very high growth area on, on multiple dimensions, right? It's high growth just on pure population, right? It's growing. Um, it's also uh, uh, aging. I suppose we're all aging, um, but uh, like most of the province, uh, it is uh, there aren't a younger cohort coming in behind the aging cohort. So the so the uh, the relative demand on healthcare is growing, even if the population wasn't. Uh, the relative demand on on, the, uh, on healthcare is growing. So when you have growth in demand. Um, presuming that that can be funded, uh, then that gives you room. In, in a sense, it's you know, if Jonathan's getting one dollar and I'm getting one dollar, but there's a new one dollar coming in, it's a lot easier to integrate and to change the system when there's a new one dollar coming in. So we could be asking Jonathan to do things that he wasn't doing before because now there's a new one dollar. In other areas in the province where we don't see this kind of growth, in fact, we have areas in the province where we see negative growth, it gets a little tougher because now if Jonathan's been getting a dollar and I've been getting a dollar, uh, uh, now there's only a buck 50 coming in um, and we're going to be scrapping over, well, who just lost the 50 cents or the quarter? So it's, it's hard to make some changes. All, all that to say, I think that what we're seeing across the province is that if we continue to operate in the way we are, even if another dollar is coming in, it's two dollars worth of demand that is coming in, but only one dollar of supply. Um, so that creates these two factors can create the opportunity to change the way that we're operating. And we see that um, in, uh, in in different models. I'll use an acute uh, model, but uh, we can use uh, non-acute models as well. In an acute model, uh, we have uh, where we're moving more and more to day procedures um, and uh, starting to offer the idea that why do we have to, for, for everybody involved, why are we uh, doing procedures that require an overnight stay when in fact, if you change the procedure, the, the technique, you can do it on a same day basis. So now you're seeing a lot more people for a lower price point and, and uh, a relatively same uh, amount of resource. Uh, so that's uh, uh, one model. Another model that is, uh, tougher and only works when we are in a, an ACO type model is where we truly get into the preventative care models that I think the question was really speaking about. Um, and so an example in this model would be where um, uh, 
uh, we set up a model that would say uh, instead of uh, going for an MRI, uh, you go for an appointment that says you don't need the MRI. Uh, and in fact, they offer uh, an alternative to going for the MRI. And so that's wonderful. That's absolutely fantastic. But if that person who did the consult, um, let's say it's a nurse practitioner um, or, or even a surgeon or whomever, if they're not being funded for that, um, they, they would need to be funded for it. So that's a new, new amount of money coming in. You can say, well, that was offset by the fact that you didn't do the MRI. Um, but where, in fact, is that savings occurred? By not doing something, unless you uh, actually close the shift on the MRI, um, you actually haven't saved any of those dollars. So switching our funding model to a prevention model um, is going to be a challenge. And I would say impossible if we stay in a siloed based model where the hospital gets its funding, primary care gets its funding, because once you separated all that out, the, 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 the new behavior in primary care um, or in preventative care may result in some savings over on the hospital side the hospital doesn't necessarily experience it. And now from a system perspective, it just feels like an additional cost. So all the way back to Ontario Health, um, my hope is, is that we can start to change some of these funding models to incent what you've just described in the question, keep people healthier. And if you keep people healthier, there's a, there's a gain across the system, which again is the ACO model. If we're not gonna tackle that sort of integrated funding model, then I think we're gonna struggle as we have been in truly moving to a health and preventative model. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I think uh, when you look, I, I go back to your hospital example with the day surgeries, it's a lot, uh, it's difficult to see how you could manage chronic care in a, in a way that would, would be more less is more type approach. Uh, so it really does leave preventative as the primary way of, of treating more people with the same amount of resources. But uh, though one, uh, a follow-up question that was posted was about uh, the use of virtual care, mm -hmm. um, particularly for managing chronic care, and that may be an opportunity. Um, can you yeah, so for sure, for sure. And, and virtual care is sort of in my wheelhouse. I'm, I'm a big uh, fan and supporter of virtual care and, and uh, I spent a little bit of time on it. Uh, virtual care is, is a prime example, a prime example of where our funding models have, have uh, really challenged us to, to use virtual uh, to its fullest capabilities. Now, we've seen a shift in that through COVID, uh, mainly because uh, the province op opened up uh, the billing codes for the physicians um, so that they could do it. And listen, I, and, and that, that, by the way, was not a shot of physicians. Uh, the reality is, is that we all like to be paid for our work, every one of us. Um, and so uh, that's the way that that's how it is. Um, and, uh, you know, so much of our um, health system, uh, the funding models is based on the geography upon which the fund, the transaction occurred. Um, and so our funding models are based, you know, if you're a physician and you do a telephone consult uh, uh, or a virtual consult, often you won't get paid at all. Uh, if you make them come into your, into your office, you'll be paid. Uh, if you see them in the ER for the exact same thing that you would have seen them in the office for and the same thing you could have done on virtual, you'll get paid even more. Um, so we're incenting people to go to the most expensive place uh, in our in our system. Um, so uh, with virtual care, uh, the, the concern has always been, um, uh, one of the concerns anyway has been that what will happen if we open up on virtual care is that if a, and I'm gonna just use the physician model because it's easiest, but it's, it's, it's not limited to the physician model. Um, if, you, uh, if you open up virtual care, if a physician typically sees 10 people a day, um, uh, when you, the, the concept behind virtual care would be, but yeah, but if I see, if we open up on virtual care, then I can see 20 people in a day virtually. And because the virtual uh, fee code was half of what the in-person was, it's cost neutral, but I've seen now 20 people, right? So that's that's kind of the theory. The fear is, is that no, 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 you're still gonna see the 10 physically, and then you're gonna do the other 20 in the evening, uh, and you're gonna bill for that, and now this, the cost of the system has just shot through the roof, and we're not gonna have any control over the cost anymore. Um, fortunately, uh, there's been many studies uh, done on this uh, over the last while, um, and we also have the study of all studies, which is COVID, and that's just not bearing out itself to be true. Um, uh, that uh, at the end of the day, 
uh, physicians are right sizing and they're saying, here's how many I can do virtually. Here's how many need to be done because virtual can't replace certain types of visits, obviously. Um, but we can find that balance. It's not going to uh, outstrip our costs. So we have to go after those kind of funding model. I'll give you one more example if I can remember the specifics of it. Um, we were, uh, this was when I was at, at Osler um, and we put in a model. It was a fantastic model where uh, uh, a person would come in for a procedure into the hospital. Uh, they would go home um, and these, these folks uh, we had been tracking um, th this particular cohort were people who were uh, frequent users of our ER. Um, and frequently on our inpatient units, okay? Um, so very high cost, if I can say it that way. Um, and so what we put in was a model where we would have uh, a nurse and or a nurse practitioner, and we gave them some very basic, the patient, we gave the, the, the patient some very basic uh, digital tools so they could upload some information for the nurse. Once a week, they had a scheduled call with the nurse um, and they loved it, the nurse loved it, uh, ER visits dropped considerably, like somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 67%. Um, inpatient vis uh, need for inpatient care dropped very, very substantially, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 or 40%. So by every measure, this is fantastic, right? The issue is, is who's going to pay for this? Because um, what happens in reality from, uh, from a hospital perspective is, uh, so what that did was it took several, in this case, uh, with these particular patients, it took several hundred, even a couple thousand ER visits. Theoretically, it took those out of the system, right? We, we never incurred the cost of those people coming into the ER. Here's the problem. We were in a high growth area. Those thousand page, uh, visits that were sort of taken out were washed over by the tens of thousands of new visits that were arriving into the ER. So we never actually saw that savings. There was no way that we could pull those dollars out and say, we're going to pull those out to, to continue to, to fund this program. Um, so it ends up that that program becomes a net cost to the system um, because we've only moved that one little piece uh, into that virtual into that virtual world and we haven't figured out a funding mechanism for it. So lots and lots of challenges as we think about how do we change the incentive models around uh, our virtual. Um, however, virtual care, there's no question, uh, and, and we're doing it now, I would also add. Uh, uh, I think about my father-in-law who, um, uh, part of his home care was wound care, uh, yet terrible ulcers, wound, wound uh, injuries on his feet. Um, and the home care uh, nurse would come in every once a week, once a month, I can't remember what it was, with some regularity and with an iPad and take a picture of it and upload that picture and send it over to the physician. They would take a look at it and be able to, to give advice back as to are the creams working and all that sort of stuff. So it's out there, but to truly embrace it and to embrace it in a way that the, the person put the question forward in terms of true prevention, uh, we really are gonna have to look at our funding uh, models and incentives and, and tweak them because they don't really support the, the uh, uh, mass scale of virtual care in the province. Thank you. Yeah. Um, on a different uh, topic, can you speak to the mental health roadmap, particularly the resource hub, and has the timeline or content changed due to COVID? Thank you. Yeah. So we uh, Ontario Health uh, is home to uh, our mental health and addiction center of excellence uh, that uh, got launched uh, in early February uh, in that, that little period where I had started at Ontario Health, but COVID hadn't wrecked my life. Uh, and so uh, uh, it was just in there. Um, and it's, it's mean um, one, of, one of the early initiatives that it's pushing on is this concept of um, moving out, uh, and I've forgotten, I know they're called a hub, but I think we've got an even nicer name for them, um, moving uh, out um, this capacity to do uh, um, uh, psychological supports out into the community uh, using a number of hubs across the province. Um, fortunately, that uh, fortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately, that has largely progressed per schedule. Um, it, COVID has not had too big of an impact on that. Uh, in fact, uh, COVID has uh, uh, pushed us, the province, to think about can we put more services online uh, in the, in that way and get more services distributed out into the communities? Because uh, 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 clearly. Um, there's been a, a very substantial uh, impact from a mental health perspective on COVID. In fact, uh, some of you may have seen there's a little chart up there that talks about the third wave. 
um, of COVID and the impact that it's going to have. The first, the first two we know about. The third being the impact on societal mental health uh, and addictions negative impacts because of the impact of the first two waves. Um, so um, I would say on the one hand, direct answer to the question, uh, has, COVID has not uh, impacted it. It's on the same timeline and moving forward. On the other hand, COVID has probably increased the demand even further than what we thought was out there. Uh, and, and we were already struggling, you know, as an understatement uh, to meet that demand. Jonathan, uh, perhaps one more question before we wrap up. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Oh, now you're going to make me choose one. Uh, well, given Close that your eyes. <laughs> this is my that COVID I'm... hair, by the way. If the question was, what the hell's going on with that guy's hair? Uh, <laughs> my COVID hair. I can't get a haircut. You should pick the picture up from before. That was much better. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to comment given the size of my uh, my <laughs> growing beard here. So. Um, Given that Ontario Health is still in the integration process, has the framework, vis vision, mission, or funding priorities of the agency changed dramatically post COVID? Um, not, not in a written down way, um, but I would say uh, in a um, uh, in a almost in a moral way. Um, I think that we are. Uh, it's caused us to. to it's caused me. Um, I think it's caused many of our leaders and uh, it's caused, I think, the Ministry of Health um, and, uh, and our board to think differently about what is it that we really need to do and how are we really going to support our providers. Um, and, and just to give you a very concrete example of what I mean, um, you know, we're, we're struggling through, if you think about the, the models that I talked about before and this concept of um, out in the regions, we're going to have, uh, you know, the, the, we have the hospitals and, and primary care and home care, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna try to meld that together a little bit better, whether it's uh, through the OH, some form of the OHD vehicle. And then, and then what's that support that Ontario Health is going to bring uh, to that to that uh, Ontario, uh, the Ontario Health team and, and to the field. Um, and I think our thinking around, my thinking around what that might look like, um, what kind of support is necessary uh, to truly uh, uh, make a difference, a positive difference for, for the patients and the residents. Um, I have a bit of a different view about that. Um, we've played a very different role than I ever thought we would uh, in integration. Uh, certainly, Ottawa is a tremendous example of that. Um, you know, bringing together uh, public health, uh, uh, the, the hospitals, primary care, maybe not quite as much as I would have liked to have seen, um, but a, a, a different rule of integration than what I would have imagined going forward. Um, probably, um, if, you, if you think of, of, of uh, uh, in terms of thick and thin, um, I was thinking that we would be a, a pretty thin group out in the regions. Um, I think maybe maybe we need to be a little thicker than I was thought than I originally thought. But but where where uh, what functions that would mean, um, particularly as it relates to uh, supporting clinical care, might be a little bit different than what I was originally thinking. Um, and uh, you know, in uh, a very specific way, uh, thinking a little more about the uh, Cancer Care Ontario model, um, where we have. Um, uh, regional clinicians embedded into the 14 um, uh, cancer centers. Uh, maybe we need to do a little more of that kind of thing of putting more clinical resource support into the environment uh, uh, that have sort of this dual relationship where they're fully embedded in the environment, but, but with a connection point back into Ontario Health. Um, maybe that's a model that we would have to do. So certainly has caused us to, to pause and think about how, how we might do that. Um, and then lastly, I think uh, accelerating as best as we can on the ground integration is at the end of the day, it it's, again comes back to how are we presenting ourselves as a collective uh, to our patients and our residents and our clients and our citizens? Um, and, and, and what can we do to, 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 uh, to improve that? Regretfully, we have to draw this to a close. Um, and um, Matt, for a guy who graduated in modern English poetry, <laughs> and despite your Toronto MHA, you've done extremely well. Uh, <laughs> it's been a lot of things I've had to overcome, George. I've had to overcome. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm personally, and I'm sure many of the people that are online are, are, are thankful 
that during this perfect storm where we've got health transformation and COVID working hand in hand, that you are at the helm of Ontario Health. Very grateful for you taking on that leadership role. You're a great role model for our students. So I want to say thank you for taking the time um, and for sharing your insights on the vision and the future of Ontario Health within this very complex mosaic uh, as we try to create integrated systems of care. Um, just a, a couple of other thank yous. I want to thank Colin and Genevieve and Jonathan uh, for all the work they've done to make this event possible. Thank you very much. And Genevieve, I know you hold a special uh, spot in Matt's heart now as a, a very uh, progressive, maybe aggressive slide changer. <laughs> well done. Uh, just a couple of words uh, to all of those who have attended. Um, keep an eye out for the post event survey. We'd love your feedback and also for the recording of the presentation, which will be made available to you. And just I'll conclude with a plug for the MHA program. Uh, we see ourselves as a very supportive resource, education resource and research resource to our community. And we are still in the process of accepting applicants for September 2020. So I speak to the employers um, out there. If you have anyone who you feel you want to support in this respect by providing them with the MHA, a credential, uh, we are still open for applications for uh, September 2020. So on that note, I'll conclude. I'll thank Matt again. Uh, thank you to Evelyn too for all the uh, um, rounding up she had to do to get uh, sure that uh, Matt's schedule was available. Thank you and have a, uh, a great day. Thanks very much everybody.